Well, good evening, everybody. Um, welcome to Garden Master Glasses Thursday Garden Chat. Um, <clears throat> uh, looks like I'm on my own this evening. Uh, Annie has been in Poland. She was doing a workshop for Garden Master Class Polska yesterday. Um, and um, I thought she might have been back by now, but obviously still still in transit. Um, so, uh, yeah, Garden Masterclass Polska has been going around about a year now uh, with a number of webinars and a national conference back in the spring. Um, it's one of two international initiatives we've got, the other one being uh, Academia del Paisaje. Um, so for any Spanish speakers, we've got actually a very large amount of material that um, Ignacio in Madrid has been getting together. Um, so uh, now um, we're getting towards the end of the year, but we've still got a few webinars coming up, which I should be uh, reminding you of. Um, next week, uh, the 5th of December, I will be doing um, a, a, a webinar about weeds, um, which is a big topic, weed control, one that people don't seem to talk about very much. So uh, I thought it's important that we should consider it first of all from the standpoint of what is a weed um and uh the, the much more flexible approach we're taking now to spontaneous plants but then actually looking down looking at the nitty-gritty of how we deal with uh, problem plant species um we've got, we've got <coughs> one more event before um christmas uh, a webinar event which is a replay of Bettina Jaugstetter's uh, very informative and quite entertaining uh, webinar on mixed perennial plantings. Uh, the German planting supreme of Bettina is, um, um, talks her way through this uh, really important methodology of, of planting. And we've played that twice before, and it's of continual interest, so we're going to be playing it again. Uh, after Christmas, uh, we launch on January the 9th with uh, our first webinar of the season with Julie Moyamaservi, a very insightful American garden designer. There's a three-parter uh, with um, Caroline Jackson, her Bad Botany course, which she did last year. We're doing another version of it this year with different plant families um, and a great opportunity to for gardeners to find out a bit more about um plants uh, 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 from the from the, the botanical viewpoint uh, we've also just launched or just about to launch our live events program this is for events uh, in um, they're all in England in fact uh, next um, um, uh, next 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 year and um, what we do we're going to be doing members can get at get can book those uh, they'll have a week to book those before everyone else can so there's uh, real advantages to being a member um, so just to tempt you and perhaps encourage you to become a member and book early and in fact five percent cheaper um, is um, uh, in March mid-March to the 13th of March I am doing a two-day garden writing course um, 15th of March, an evening with Midori Shintani and Dan Pearson at uh, Yo Valley. The 1st of May, Annie is doing her garden model making workshop that's proved a great success. The 3rd of May, we've got Jason Ingram's photography course. June the 7th, uh, a repeat of an evening, uh, an evening event we ran last year. Uh, Delos, um, Harold and Vita's Forgotten Garden with Dan Pearson and Troy Scott Smith. And on July, New Brownfield Landscapes, John Little. Uh, and again in July, Regenerative Landscapes at, with Joe McCurr at her garden just south of Bath. So we've got uh, a lot to, to tempt you with in terms of live events. But anyway, um, we should return to um, this evening's programme and... Um, just a reminder to those of you who, who are perhaps not familiar with us, we do this as a as a as a weekly public service broadcast. Um, our normal business being pay to view webinars and those live events. I was just uh, telling you about. Um, you, if you can, if you just want to keep in touch with us, <laughs> then do please sign up for the uh, monthly uh, email newsletter. Um, on on the homepage of of our website, um, and um, 
all of these public service broadcasts go up onto YouTube. They sit there for several months, uh, where in fact most people see them. And then after a few months, uh, we archive them, or at least archive most of them for members. So now, um, this evening, we've got a recording with Professor Jane Memmott, who is one of Britain's leading experts on wild bees. Uh, pollinators have been very much uh, in our awareness for the last few years, um, either to do with domestic bees, which in reality, being domestic animals, don't really face any major threats. But wild bees, solitary bees, uh, proved much more uh, sensitive to uh, habitat loss and, and various other impacts. Um, and uh, Jane does some remarkable work with her, her, her students, sort of micro pipetting tiny volumes of nectar out of out of flowers. Um, and uh, she is a very, very interesting person to talk to about uh, the whole business of, of of what we do in gardens and landscapes and how that really does uh, impact wild bee populations and of course um, the role that, that uh, bees can play in gardens. So um, let's share screen and go over to the recording which I made with uh, Jane um, in, in August when I was over in England in August and it was rather quiet satisfaction of sitting in her study with um, several of my books uh, on the bookcase uh, behind, which is always nice. Anyway, here we are. Not looking too ruffled. Not too bad. I mean, hey, washed my hair this morning. Very <laughs> presentable, kind of outdoorsy sort of people. So. Yes, I, 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 uh, I went, just been out to Devon and there was somebody I said I wanted to come and I want to have a little interview with you about your your garden and and um turned up there and she'd clearly just come back from the hairdresser <laughs> she was a bit too kind of uh... yeah so I, I was so embarrassed I mean, really, it was really really it was really embarrassing people say they they tied to their gardens up before i've gone around oh, yeah, like, yeah, no. <laughs> um, so yeah no we'd like the untidy look so um yeah yeah Right, so I probably just had a few. I've got a few jots, but generally I just ad lib. So, yes, yeah, um, yeah. so do we look at the screen or do we? Look uh, at you? We um, we a uh, bit of both. Bit I, of both. I think you know we want to be seen to be in in conversation. In, in, yeah. in, in, in conversation. So you know, you know, I'll occasionally check the screen, make sure it's good, still there, and we are we are recording. Um, so. Um, <clears throat> The microphone is obviously working. Is it flipping up and down? Yeah. So, Jane, uh, you are one of the lead voices in looking at bees and pollinators, uh, which is a great interest to many of us at the moment. Uh, what's your actual job position? So I'm a professor of ecology at the University of Bristol, and I've been at Bristol about 25 years. Mm -hmm. so. so you obviously have interest way beyond bees, but how long have you specialised in, in wild bees? Uh, since about, uh, 1999, I wrote my first paper on pollinators, right, right. so I'd been interested in them for quite a while, yes. but that's when it kind of started. And since then, mm -hmm. it's been uh, probably one of the major things we do, actually. It's not yeah. the only thing we do, but no. it's certainly one of the big things. Yes. What got you in, in, in interested in, in bees and pollinators initially? Oh, um, it was it's often in science. It's by accident. So I, yes. I was a relatively new lecturer at yeah. Bristol University. Um, I was walking through the library because in those days we actually had physical libraries. These days, yes. which everything's online, but we had a library. Yeah. And there was a journal on a shelf and you have photographs on the front of yes. the latest issue. And so there was a picture on the front of a bee, caught my interest. I looked at the paper and that was a paper by an American academic talking about looking at pollinators as networks of interactions. Because there's yeah. been a lot of pollinator research over the years, yeah. but it tends to look at particular plants and particular pollinators. Yes. Yes. This looks at the whole community. Mm. And at that point, I'd been working in um, Costa Rica, looking at networks of interactions between um uh, plants, tropical uh, insects, and parasitoids. So I could do networks, mm -hmm. basically. And this article had this lovely throwaway line saying, of course, it'd be lovely to have a, a network of interactions between all the plants and all the pollinators as a place, but that's just too difficult to do. And I kind of thought, actually, it's not. It's not that difficult. Yes. And so I did it. And we just used that kind of network approach ever since as a tool. And lots of other people use it now as well. well yeah. And that, that kind of, so a lot of science does happen a bit by something catches your attention. Yes. And then yes. you're off and away. And 20 years later, you're still doing it. So you've so, been a bit of an innovator here then. 
Yeah. Certainly with the network side of things, yes. 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 Yeah. Could you explain a little bit more about how that, how that actually works? Yeah, so if you imagine you're sat in the middle of a flowering meadow, yes. say, uh, all around you are there's lots of species of plants and there's lots of things visiting those plants. Mm. So all the, the the kind of network approach does is it allows you to capture that information. Mm. So you end up with a, a a list of plant species, a list of pollinators, but you've also got all of the interactions between them. So you yes. know, say that devil's bit scabies in that field is visited by six species of pollinator, one of which is really common, four of which are kind of, you know, they're moderately common and yeah. the rest are really rare. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you get Latin binomials and everything. So everything is identified down to the species level. Right. Yes, yes. So we work very closely with taxonomists. Yes. Um, and and you end up with a, it's a food web. You know, yeah. you kids see food webs in, in you know, in basic science um, textbooks. It's, it, it's just using that approach for pollinators. The, yes. One of the nifty things, though, is a, a food web tells you who eats who. Yeah. Pollinator, pollinators and pollination is a two-way process because mm -hmm. you've got the the bees and flies and butterflies looking for food that are offered nectar and pollen, mm -hmm. but you've also got the flowers being pollinated. So yeah. you're, you're capturing a mutualism. So there's um, there's two sets of relationships there. Yes. So you get two for the price of one, yeah, which is yeah. always appealing. Mm -hmm. So yeah, yeah. Uh, so there has, over the last few years, been an extraordinary amount of interest in pollinators. Uh, and so often when media get hold of things, there's misunderstandings, uh, commercial pressures have, have played their part. I mean, the whole thing of a, we all know, we all know that you know, going to the garden centre, sort of 10 best plants for pollinators. Yeah. Uh, and uh, also a lot of confusion between you know the honeybee set of issues, which is yeah. something else, and the wild bee and pollinator issues, which which are, are quite different. Um, what's your feeling about all the the, the 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 quality of the media coverage? Uh, I think that the expression "all publicity is good publicity." There's no yeah, interest yes, in that, yes, yes, so yes. it's really raised the yeah. profile of pollinators, yeah. and actually they. There is something about pollinators that really captures the public's imagination yes, in a yes. way that most other groups, yeah, most other yeah. groups of insects don't. Yeah, yeah. You know, if you work on earwigs or blowflies or something, yes, you know, yes. you don't get that much no, love from no, the public. No. But certainly when, when we worked on it, we ran a big project called the Urban Pollinators Project, and that was an absolute godsend for any sort of media project. Yeah, the media came to us over that yes. one. So something about pollinators that people do find charismatic, which is interesting because some of them do sting. Yeah, you know, honeybees and bumblebees, such bees yeah. stink, not very often, but they, yeah. they can do. And, but they are charismatic. Yes. And to me, the sound of bees in a meadow or in your garden or wherever is, is the sound yeah. of summer. Yeah. yeah. So, and I think a lot of people, there's some intrinsic liking of them. Yes. But there are some misunderstandings out there. I mean, the, the, the honeybee, I try not to be rude about honeybees, but, you know, <laughs> the honeybee is, is it takes, it's, it's not overstudied. It's a fantastic insect. And I mean, lots of the basic, the communication work that's been done on it is, is amazing. Mm -hmm. But when the, a lot of people, when they think of pollination, they think of the honeybee. And that's a tiny, tiny bit of the story. Yes. Um, you know, for one, there's one honeybee species in the, in the country, and it's not really a native, there is a very rare native honeybee, but it's super rare. You never see it. Mm -hmm. the, you know, honeybees are basically a, a farm species in the UK. Yes, yes. Whereas there's something like 26 species of native bumblebee and, you know, 250 odd species of solitary bee. Yeah. And they don't get the anywhere near the attention. Bumblebees are slowly inching their way up, actually, yeah. but solitary bees are still the big unknown. Yes. You know, twenty years ago there were a handful of people working on bumblebees in the UK. Mm -hmm. There's now quite a few more, but still solitary bees are are lagging behind. Yeah. So, and and things like um, people often didn't realise that flies were really important as pollinators. Mm, yes. Flies, you know, it's, and it's not just the hover flies. You've got your your bee flies, yeah. um, and and empids and things like that. And actually, Bristol, where where we are, is it's the only place in the world where I've actually seen lots of bee flies. You know, really, yes. they are really common in the early spring in April, in, in kind of April May sort of time. Um, they'll be on your pulmonarias and your cowslips, yes. and I'd seen one or two before in my entire life before moving to mm -hmm. Bristol. So for some reason, we're a hotspot of yeah. oh, bee right. flies, yeah. yes. and they are incredibly charismatic little yes. insects. Mm -hmm. So the bottom line is, it's, it's not just the honeybee. There's, yeah. there's loads more stuff out there, yes, and it's yes. super interesting, mm -hmm. uh, very diverse, um, and that diversity gives you some protection because honeybees are declining. They, they, you know, they've had a hard time over the yes. last kind of 10, 20 years. Mm -hmm. We're working on um, pollinator systems in um, in Nepal a lot at the moment, oh. and honeybees are declining out there. And if you just depend on one pollinator, then yeah. if you depend on one of anything, it's never yes. you're not very resilient to change. Mm -hmm. So with climate change and everything else that's, that's going on, we really do need to be looking after those, you know, several hundred other species yes, of pollinator. Yes, yes. which of course do play quite a, a commercially important role. Oh, yeah, in pollination. yes, they do. So so a, a handful of crops like almonds and um, a few others, honeybees are. Yeah, really, really important. But yes. for most things, 
those wild pollinators do a substantial yeah. amount of the yes, um, yes. Um, the, uh, the the pollination. I think yes. the cat's about to leap up in front of us. <laughs> But yeah, just ignore him. He, he wafts across the street in a okay. rather decorative fashion. <laughs> um, so what is the current situation in Britain with wild bee populations? Um, all the evidence suggests that they are declining. Most things in, actually in Britain are declining, whether you look at bees or plants or yeah. birds or whatever. Um, there are a few, uh, there's a handful of things that are doing well, like yeah. hornets, interestingly, are doing well, buzzards are doing well. Yes. Um, so there are good news stories, but the, the if you look at all the papers on pollinators, yeah. which, of course, what we haven't got is long-term data. Well, so yes, for farmland yes. birds, you yeah. can look at really good, high-quality well, data yes, sets. Yes. For wild pollinators, you've got to use a much kind of a more statistical approach, yeah. looking at, you know, what's in collections, and there's some really clever stuff out there. Yeah, yeah. But all of the studies do tend to point in the same direction, mm -hmm. that things aren't looking looking that great. Yeah. We've lost some bumblebees, others are really rather rare. There's a handful of common species, so in towns and cities there's about six species that are still moderately common, so yes. they're still bumblebees. Mm -hmm. But the habitat specialists, um, you know, there's a lot that aren't doing that well. Mm -hmm. So so it's not looking great, but yes. one, one of the wonderful things, well, there's many wonderful things about working with insects, but with regards to turning populations around, you know, they're not elephants or albatrosses. They have a generation every single year. Yes, yes. So, you know, you can do things and insects will respond quite quickly. Yes, so yes. we're a long way from, you know, it, it's all been doomed. They're not, but we really do need to be doing something yes, now. Yes, and, yes. and lots of things are being done, mm -hmm. but probably more yeah more needs to be done yeah yeah yes, so. yes um could you say a little bit more about your own research and or and also the the research of uh, students your 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 students yeah no um right so we I'm trying to think so historically we started off with putting together these first networks and we use those as a means of sampling communities yes. to ask about environmental change mm -hmm. so that change might be the effect of uh, climate change, yes. the impact of farming, whether organic farming really does lead to more biodiversity than conventional farming. Um, with pollinators, we've done a lot on um, urbanization. Yeah. Um, so we measured in forensic detail the number of pollinators in um, Bristol, Reading, Leeds and Edinburgh yeah. Yeah. and compared those to matching areas of um, Eden. So we well, actually we did two things. We looked at, um, first of all, compared cities with nature reserves yes. and farmland with 12 cities all over the UK, um, 12 farms and 12 nature reserves. Yes. And actually, town cities look kind of, they're not that bad, not as bad as you think. There's actually yeah. more species of, um, I think it's more species to be in towns and cities than in the adjoining countryside. Yes. And the positive interpretation of that is that, you know, towns and cities are actually rather good. Yes. The not so positive interpretation is actually means that, you know, the farmland's actually in really bad conditions. Yes. Yeah. And it's probably a bit, a bit of both, but generally species, towns and cities are actually really quite good. I can imagine, I can imagine. They're full of yes. flowers, yes. you know, yes. and that's yes. what they eat. So, yes. um, but then we looked in detail at our four focal cities, which were Bristol, Reading, Leeds and Edinburgh, and asked where uh, both pollinators food and pollinators are in cities mm -hmm. and gardens are the you yeah. know that is the yes. you know something like 80 odd percent of the nectar in cities is in gardens yes, so what yes. what gardeners do is really important mm -hmm. um so so we've done a lot on urbanization yes um we do a lot on what's called robustness which is robustness is when you take those networks it asks if you lose a few species mm -hmm. Do you get a cascade of extinctions and yes. the kind of community kind of goes pop and disappears yeah. or is it res kind of resilient yes, to change yes, yes. um so we've done quite a lot of work on that mm -hmm. and then the, the projects at the moment the big one running is this project in in nepal on smallholder farms yeah. asking how um it's, it's looking at that chain between you have climate change happening that impacts pollinators in various yeah. ways yes. that impacts crop production mm. and then we go right through to what people are eating yeah. looking mm. particularly at the uh, micronutrients because in the developing world most of the micronutrients in your diet come from insect pollinated crops right so right. if yeah. um pollinators are declining yes. then um there's some nutritionists that have actually done a, a really big paper in the lancet showing that actually if you model pollinator declines you can follow the knock you can predict knock-on effects in oh, people's diet gosh, amazing. so yeah yes. no it is actually yes, so yes. so we've been sampling pollinators crops and yeah. people yes, in yeah. 10 remote right. villages in the Himalayas gosh, right. so that that's been really fun and we're getting to the um we've got all the data in we did all this through COVID which made it really challenging yes, doing a big yes. overseas project but we um we've got the data in and right now we're um we've done a lot of work on the pollinators but we're we're just starting to join that setup with the nutrition data right. yes and yes. then looking forward um 
it's not completely official yet, but there's um, I'm, I, I've just heard of a, a grant that's coming in that means we'll be working on um, pesticides. In the first yeah. pesticide project running yeah. at the group. Yeah. Yeah. So asking um, if you stop using pesticides, um, do the insects recover and come back? Yes. So that will run for the next four years. Yeah. So it's, it's really exciting having a new project. Yes. And also, uh, presumably in that context, you'd also need to look at you know, what is the impact of not using pesticides? Yeah, you yes, it's it, it's um I mean in the place the, uh, the the countries where we're working there is it's actually gardening actually which is probably the yeah. chief culprit the the farms are all dairy farms and you do yeah. use some pesticides on dairy farms mm -hmm. but probably most of the pesticides in the system are coming from um kind of landscape people or um um gardens and things like that so but there was a pesticide ban running in in uh, um in this place and yes. um we've got control sites and actually yeah. we're predicting they were insects will pollinators will rebound and then we're interested in the the, the positive cascading effects yeah. of a pollinator recovery uh, yes because actually things like because moths are important pollinators too and if moths recover then your bat population should go up so we're uh, measuring yes. bats as yes. well yes yes uh, and also i mean there's lots of things that feed on pollinators little parasitoids okay they actually they kill the pollinators but they're an important sway the biodiversity it's yeah. like yeah. canopid flies so um so that's a really kind of big exciting project yes. that's um, yeah. going to be happening over the next four years right yes so, yes. so lots of keepers but you're never ever bored when we're no, pollinators sure, sure. there's yes, always yes. um there's always something to yeah. be working on i remember you uh describing to me before about um looking at what bees can actually get from particular flowers and that was it one hellebore is equivalent to how many snowdrops oh it was a, a lot oh, um, I can't remember. yeah no it was some ridiculously high yeah no that was the um we've done a lot of work on measuring as well as doing the network stuff we've yeah. done another um actually i forgot to mention that but another large way of what we've done is measuring what pollinators eat yes so we started off with nectar which is where that that data yeah. came from yes yes um, and actually, we did a countrywide survey and showed that we've lost a, a third of the nectar in the UK um, since the intensification of agriculture. Yeah, yeah. So that's like, if, you know, you get to the supermarket and come out with a third less shopping in your, yeah, in your basket yes, every yeah, week. Yes. You know, that's what pollinators are facing. Yes, yes. Um, so, and, and, you know, the stuff that's left, so more than 50% of the nectar in the UK comes from just four species of plant mm. from, I think, what are they? There's clover, uh, spear thistle, um, Erica and Kaluna, so yeah. Erica and, and Heather, those are the four that give you, so if something happens to one of those four yeah. species, mm -hmm. you're taking a huge bite out of what's, yeah. um, what's yes. around. Mm -hmm. So, um, and then very recently we've started working on pollen because nectar, although it's fiddly, it's you have, relatively, you have to use, um, yeah, my, my, yeah, my group is, yeah, that must be seriously fiddly. It is seriously fiddly, but it's quite straightforward. So what you do is you take your flower and it's some flowers are like, hellebores are really tricky. Their nectar is round a corner, bend, basically, yes, yeah, yes, trying to bend. Round the which when you've got a straight tube so yeah. you're using when you do a finger yeah. blood prick yes. and use those little glass tubes yes. we use exactly the same process for nectar that's no, sort of capillary action, yeah so right? capillary action sucks it up um yes. and then you do two things you measure the length in your tube yes. and you know the bore of the tube because they come in different packets of different sizes mm. so you got the length and then you what i love this is really clever but really simple you use a little machine called a refractometer, which has got no batteries, no moving parts. It's basically a fancy prism. Oh, yes. And yes. so you put a little drop of nectar onto a screen, put a lid down, yes. look at it, hold it up to the light. Light comes in and bend, it bends according to concentration. Right. Yes, yes. And you get a reading on a screen. It's like a little um, a little monocular thing, yes. a little tiny yes. short telescope. And so you measure the concentration. So if you've got volume and concentration, you yes. work out how much sugar is there. Wow. So that, although it's fiddly, mm. is very straightforward to do. Yes, yes. A couple of equations involved, but nothing, nothing major. Pollen, though, is a whole different ball game for two reasons. One, it's chemically really complicated. Yes. It's a mixture of amino acids and lipids and sterols and, and loads of other stuff. Yeah. Um, it's what makes bees grow. Nectar is like the rocket fuel that makes bees fly around as adults. Carbohydrate. Yeah, it's yeah. carbohydrate. It keeps them moving. Whereas if you want to grow a brood of bees, you need your proteins and your fats and things. Yes, yes. Um, so one, it's difficult to say what it actually is. Mm. And secondly, it's it's nectar, you measure a standing crop on a 24-hour basis. So you put a bagger over a flower, yeah. leave it for 24 hours, then you measure how much it's produced. Yes. If you think about a flower, it depends how long the flower is open. Mm. And that ver we've measured that. That varies from most flowers are between uh, one and four days. Yes. Some go up um, beyond eight days, beyond a week. Mm. So when you know how many days, first of all, you've got to measure, count the number of pollen grains, which yeah. if you think measuring nectar is kind of fiddly, <laughs> yeah, counting pollen grains is, <laughs> yeah. It, yeah, no, you do that literally using a hemocytometer. So, oh, it's really, it's, it's a whole series of laboratory stages yes. involved. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So it's a right faff. Um, you do that, um, but then you've also got to know how many days the flower is open because that pollen is dispensed over 
you know, two days, one day. Uh, yes. So things like um, bindweed, convolvulus, yeah. one day only per yeah. flower. Mm -hmm. Oilseed rape is about eight days. Yeah. Um, and most things are in the middle. Yes. Yes. So you then have to divide your amount of pollen by the number of days. So it's it's complicated, but we've just started doing it. Broadly, nectar and pollen are correlated, which yes. you expect. So it depends on the size of the flower. Mm -hmm. But you get these really interesting outliers like willow. Yeah. produce it i can't which one looks really strong in the eyes it's, it's i think it's a lot more pollen than nectar um, yes. or actually it's allium is um, another weird one alliums the wild alliums the native um the one you turn into um you cook with what's it called the um wild no, garlic. the wild garlic no, wild yeah garlic. um produces mountains of nectar yes. and very little pollen yeah um where there's other plants you know you get the poppies which produce lots of pollen and no nectar so those outliers can do some quite strange things yeah, yeah. to uh to, to, to yeah. kind of landscape level yes. productivity of pollen so we do a lot of measuring the floor resources yes. so as i understand with pollen there's quite a variation in the, in the quality yeah of the quality of the yeah. Content. yeah and also in the um liquids and sterols that, yeah. that expression you are what you eat yes you know so yes. it depends what you are eating and it's yeah so so we've just had i've just had a master's student finish um quantifying pollen at the farm scale yes and i'm working collaboratively with some very smart people in oxford and kew that are actually doing the chemistry of pollen. Mm, so yeah. when we've got kind of phenology data and data on what's in the landscape, yes. and we've got the um, chemistry, the nutritional value of that pollen, you can start to do some interesting things. I think so, yes. But yeah, yes. but there's lots, there's an awful lot in pollen. That's, yes. If it was just two or three things, it would be simpler, mm. but it's not too yeah, many yeah. things. I mean, this, so often this is a matter of, sort of balancing quantity against quality. People go on about oak trees supporting 250 plus insect yeah. species. <laughs> on the hand, you know, sycamore, which everyone hates, vast amounts of aphids which yeah it's, it's sort of i would say it's like you've got the you've got the whole food daily as opposed to the supermarket uh, yeah, yeah yeah no um i mean generally on actually it's something you are coming up later probably but the um the business of native versus alien because sycamore is kind of more of, it's not a native tree so it is european so it's, it's coming with a single aphid yes it's a platinoid. it's what? one of the very yeah Only it's only the one yeah, yeah. Uh, as far as i know it's one common one it's one of the few aphid yeah. names i can remember for some reason um and that is actually, you know, for birds, aphids, blue tits and things, great tits. It is actually, you know, it's quite useful. Yes. But your oak is a smorgasbord of yes. aphids and caterpillars and balls and all sorts of things. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so. Um, I've heard varying views on this, but the impact of honeybee populations on wild bee populations, are they in competition? <laughs> Or do flowers churn mm -hmm. out enough nectar for everybody? Uh, or does this vary from habitat to habitat, yeah. region to region? Well, it's an interesting question. So we're working on that. I've got PhD student working on this. Yeah. So if you look at the literature, the evidence is mixed. There's some studies that clearly show a negative effect yes. and others don't. So we did one where we actually showed that if you look at the correlation between bumblebees and honeybees on a heathland, yeah. you get a negative association. So the more honeybees there are, yeah. the fewer bumblebees. Yes. When we looked at what they're eating, they, they were feeding on different things. Oh, yeah. So actually something else is causing the honeybees yes. to decline yes. and the, the bumblebees to decline and the honeybees are kind of filling in the yeah. gap. What we think is happening, we've got a big project in Scotland looking at this, is it's context dependent. So a lot of the time, so if you imagine Scotland when the heather's out, yes. there's probably not a shortage of nectar. You no, know, there's yeah. way more nectar than any amount of pollinators yes. could ever, yeah. you know, feed on. But before the heather comes out and after the heather comes out, there may be crunch points mm. at which there will be competition. So yeah. so what, what we've done in um, um, Scotland is to actually do an experiment where we've put out aprits, so large numbers of hives at yes. multiple sites, and then not put them out at other sites mm -hmm. and followed those throughout the whole field season yes. and also looked at the effect of land use because it might be land use has a much bigger effect than, mm -hmm. than the presence of honeybees so we're hoping to unpick that but yeah. my my gut feeling at the moment is it's context dependent yes it can happen but it doesn't happen all the time and one of the useful things about that is that um there may be um management things we can talk about with the beekeepers to actually yes. just avoid the, the crunch points mm -hmm. so it may be that we can reduce what little competition that there is if yes. there is competition which i suspect there is at certain times of the year but it's it's not a complete global honeybees are always bad type thing. No, no, so no, um, no. so it's complicated is the yes, answer. Yes. Uh, are there also disease and parasite issues? I mean, can why the presence of, of large numbers of honeybees spread diseases or varroa? Yeah, yeah, no, that's well known. And actually, there's a really lovely study where they looked at the genotype of the diseases yes. in different parts of the country and the native 
local bumblebees picked up the exact genotype of that yes. particular hive of yeah. honeybee had. Yeah. So we know that the diseases go from the honeybees to the bumblebees. Yes. Um, and it, but it might be that bumblebees, you know, we don't know about the opposite direction no. anywhere near as well. But no. in most cases, there's vast numbers of honeybees. Yes. yes. And those diseases are definitely ending up in some right. bumblebees. Yes. And we just simply don't know about the solitary bees. No. Um, no. They probably don't go into flies and beetles and butterflies simply because they're taxonomically quite, yes. quite distinct. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But disease is an issue. And, and, yes. and you know, any animal that you keep at high density um, is is much more prone to disease. And honeybees yes. have certainly had a whole slew of all the things that people know about, like the varroa and things. Yeah. But there's a whole range of viruses they get yes. as well. Um, and they, the viruses get left on flowers. And yeah, so, when right, you yeah. know, you don't even have to be in direct contact with right, yes. um, with honeybees. Um, so there are issues with um, but there's plenty of other issues out there. I mean, um, you know, there's climate change. There's. Oh, habitat loss is probably the biggest thing yes. out there. So um, pesticide use is a big one. Mm. Um, so there's a, a range of, of challenges that pollinators yes. are, um, yes. are um, facing. Mm. So um, so it is, yeah. So it, so there's no the downside. Is there's no silver bullet. Yes. When um, peregrines were having a hard time, it was DDT. You stop yes. using DDT, problem goes away. Yeah. Peregrines recover. With with pollinators, it's much more complicated than that. Yes. There's a whole range of of uh, kind of environmental challenges they're facing yeah which probably means it needs a whole range of solutions yes, um, yes. which is why it's complicated but there's some quite uh, things like the new elms thing coming in on the farmland you know the new environmental stewardship schemes yeah. are coming there are some really quite positive mm -hmm. um policy level yes. um things that are happening it's just yeah when they happen and how well they happen and whether yes. they get kind of um yeah, moderated in some way yeah. there's still lots out there yeah. but there's quite a few things pointing in the right direction yeah good good yes yes yeah um so with uh i mean this whole discussion about native and non-native plants mm. which unfortunately is far too informed by what happens in north america where the the issues are different and quite honestly the kind of nature of public debates like this is often different as well. Um, yeah. and how many British bee species are, are real specialists as opposed to generalists? Oh, it's, it's a minority, yeah. uh, a yeah. very small minority, but those tend to be species of conservation concern. They're right. the ones yes. that are doing really yeah. quite badly. Yes. Um, so we shouldn't forget about them, but one of the one of the reasons that cities are probably quite good for pollinators is that most pollinators are generalists. Yes. If it's pollen and nectar, mm. you know, unless you're a super specialist, yes. a lot of plants will provide those yes. two resources. Yes. Um, so for the specialists, which are mostly the um or sultry bees, mm. is that's where for the most are there's bumblebees that you tend to get in particular habitats that that um but there's, uh, there's not one bee that just feeds on one species no. of plant, whereas there are solitary bees that yeah. do that. Yes, yes. So it is an issue, but it's it's more of a positive thing in some ways, yeah. that there's, it does mean that urban habitats are nowhere near as bad for pollinators as they would be for, say, I, I things like moths and butterflies, yes. which are much picky. The, the larva requirements there are much more hardwired. Yeah. Yeah. You know, a peacock butterfly caterpillar is never going to feed on a... The, the caterpillar will never feed, say, on a bud leaf. Yeah. The adult will feed on the bud leaf flowers, yes. but they are hardwired to, like koala bears, to only feed on a right. few things, yes. 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 Um, which makes it much harder to kind of restore herbivores, um, whereas pollinators are pretty, uh, most are pretty cosmopolitan. Right. Yes. yes. And providing you don't have flowers which are too complicated. Yes. So, so you know, we try and grow a lot of pollinator-friendly things, but there's a few things I love that are very pollinator-unfriendly, like um, Lobelia tupas are favourite. Oh, yes, yes. And it's designed, for, is it, I think it's from Chile or somewhere, and it's designed for a, a hummingbird with a very long curved beak. Yes. I've yes. never seen anything, nothing can rob it because it's too big and tough a flower. Mm -hmm. And so it, it's got a huge amount of nectar in those flowers, yes. but it's completely useless because yes, yes. I still grow it because it's gorgeous. Yes. But, mm -hmm. um, but a lot of flowers are much, much simpler than, than that. Yes. Um, and British pollinators, well, all pollinators, they will rob things as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So they'll chew a hole in the back of a fuchsia yes. or something like that. So yeah. well, the salvia I've got in the front is yeah. perforated. I, I that. Yeah, yes, no, yes, it's, yes. it's heavily robbed. Yeah. But, um, but there's a few things they just cannot access. But yes. there's not that many no. flowers that yes. are completely inaccessible to because that, is, that is an issue with a certain number of species from the americas or south africa that are, are basically they're, they're bird pollinated and yeah knowledge about that is not tends not to be very well known. No, no. um and I, I was um but yes yeah, you say a lot of them can be accessed well one thing that surprised me this year actually was melianthus major yeah there's these enormous flowers that ooze this black nectar 
I thought, well, you know, it's clear, clearly sunbird pollinated. Um, I thought well, they, they do so well here in the garden. Yeah. I then noticed, in fact, a lot of bees were feeding off them. Yeah. So somehow they found a way in. Yeah, no, they, I mean, th there are a few that are plainly possible, but they are pretty, uh, bees in particular are cognitively, because, you know, Selection has worked on the bin smart because that's the best way to rear colony. Yes, they yes. they do make far more decisions than say flies or butterflies, yes. and so they do. They're prop. They have problem solving abilities. Right. Yes. So um, they will learn to to rob and do all sorts of things. Yes. Um, yeah, Melianthus. I get. Yeah, it's South African, isn't it? Yeah. So it's, um, yeah. Yeah. Um, are pollinators? Uh, any kind of indicator species and I think we have this problem in mm. trying to make some sort of an assessment of the the, the biodiversity potential of a particular uh, planting or particular habitat uh, usually a fairly artificial or semi-natural one and you know, it is extraordinarily difficult to give it any sort of overall measure in, on a kind of regional scale you could argue I suppose that raptors and carnivores being the sort of head, head yeah, of the bureau, you I suppose. Okay, yeah, not as a buzz of kites, you know, yeah. you're the eagle, you're doing okay. But then yeah. on, a, on a smaller scale, uh, is there any value in, in, in thinking of them as, as indicator species? Uh, I've never seen the definitive data set. I mean, no. basically, if it's good for pollinators, it means you've got lots of plants and flowers, but the, yes. because they've got such a specific requirement in terms of their um, their diet, it doesn't yes. tell you about the availability of food. But what it does mean, it just means a bit of everything, because something like, if you think of your hoverflies mm -hmm. as larvae, those are, they feed on aphids, they feed on rotting plant material, they live in water, yeah. they've got a whole rate, they're predator, you know, they, they do a whole range of different yes. things. And if you've got hoverflies, it means there's the niches for those larvae to do all of those different yeah. things. Mm -hmm. So broadly, if you've got lots of pollinators, it's a positive step, but it doesn't yes prove you're brilliant yes. at lots of other things you may not be particularly good for um herbivores that have got very specific diets but it's a it, it's it's it doesn't be it'd be very rare to have lots of pollinators and that means it's really bad but yes. I, I've not seen a data set that proves that they're really good mm -hmm. but it, it's generally a positive sign that yeah. people are doing yes. fairly nice yes. things for insects yeah. Yeah. so um yeah I mean there is actually a lot of interest one of the issues with a lot of stuff on pollinators is, and I said earlier on about that, you know, we've got these really long term farmland bird data sets. And for pollinators, we have the butterfly monitoring scheme. Yes. Butterflies are, they visit flowers, they need flowers to food, feed on. They're not enormously important pollinators no. um, because so little of the butterfly actually touches the flower. If you think about it, they stand on their tippy toes. Yes. And they've got a very long, thin mouth part, and there's really not much pollen. So they don't to, oh, right they right. just don't trans, unlike a bee that's covered in fluff and fur and, yeah. and you know, gets really in there deep and, you yes. know, rolls around in the nectar so butterflies and moths they do have pollen on them but not not much no, um, no, no, no. whereas your bees where they get completely slathered in pollinators yeah. so they are they are a bit important but so there is a good pollinator a, a, a butterfly monitoring scheme and actually if it's good for butterflies it's probably good for bees and lots yeah. of other things um there's a bumblebee transect running now and then there's a new um because of the interest in pollinators that has kind of come from nowhere in the last kind of 10 15 years or well, come from a very low base it didn't come from nowhere um, there is um, a, a UK pollinator monitoring scheme yes. now running where they're doing very systematic surveys in a number of big quadrats around the country. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of linked also, I think, with a system science programme as well. Uh, yeah. So we are going to have much better systematic yeah. data. Yes. Because yes. you need to do the same thing through time, just like yeah. we've done with farmland birds, to yeah. really get an idea mm -hmm. of whether pollinators are going up or down yes. Yes. or staying about the same. Mm -hmm. And because insects are really hard to work on because their numbers very hugely in, anyway, in any case, yes. much more so than farm than birds because yeah. of the weather. Mm. So you do need quite uh, kind of, normally it's done through a kind of fairly complex statistical process trying to work out whether it's noise or a signal. Yeah, yeah. Um, but we, yeah, there's some people that are very good at doing that sort yes, of thing. Yes, yes, So, yeah. And what can gardeners, uh, garden designers, landscape professionals do? To, yeah, what can you do? Yeah, yeah. Well, first of all, I think it's important that we do as much as we can. And as I say, 80 odd percent of the nectar in towns and cities is from gardens. So what, yes. what landscape people and gardeners do, it makes a big difference. So a, a mix of things, you know, yeah. having lots of different species there, looking at the phenology of nectar production. So um because what pollinators things like bumblebees come out in the queen comes out in february march and the, the you know there's a whole season of workers lots of a brood broom reared and then the queens go into hibernation october so you need year-round food so looking at that phenology of production and making sure that there aren't 
big gaps or if they are they're local because a, a beacon always go next door you know if your garden looks a bit thin in july yeah. then you know until your stuff comes yes, out yes. then you know on that scale at which your pollinator moves so yeah. phenology is really important mm-hmm. and we've been looking at hunger gaps in the countryside which has far less nectar in it so yeah. mm-hmm. or certainly a bit less um so yeah looking at that phenology side is important um Having some non-natives, I think, is actually, although they will feed on natives rather as well as non-natives, because although they feed on all those Americans, you know, I've got, you've, you've got your own garden, there's species from looking at my front garden, you've got a whole bunch of stuff from South Africa, from the Americas, from Mexico, from, you know, all over the world. But th- those native plants, they they always seem to be disproportionately important. And I know um, yeah. when Natasha and Devere looked at the pollen from where honeybees were going at the National Botanic Garden of Wales, Wales yeah. where they could visit, they could have anything they wanted, those honeybees yes, yes. just about, within, you know, within travelling distance of their hives. And it was on the native stuff she found most of them. And if you go to the, the Bristol Botanic Gardens, that little meadow they've got in the middle, oh, yes, yes. it's nearly always got more pollinators on it than yeah. any of the borders. Yeah. And some of those natives are drop-dead gorgeous. You know, they are really nice things to have in your garden. So, you know, we have Viper's Bugloss and Foxgloves and the um linearias yes. and you know go for the cherry charismatic ones they have big flowers full of nectar and pollen um going for um open flowers rather than lots of really kind of tubular complicated things yes. like your red hot pokers aren't a great deal of use no, but I mean, you know they're, that's exactly yeah so it just that's you exactly know and actually i've seen hoverflies get stuck in those as well they seem to go in and not be able to reverse yeah. out very well so having open flowers that are, where things are very accessible is something not all and everything but if you're going to grow you know, dahlias, make sure you've got some single ones yes. as well. Yes. The pom 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 ones are hopeless. I can yes, you know, yes. they're, all those extra petals, modified nectar. So, yeah. um, but just make sure on the roses again, you know, if you like your old fashioned roses, which I, I do like old fashioned roses, but you always have single, you know, yeah. just make sure you've got a mix. Um, and then actually, if you live in the countryside, we're starting to do some work right now, which we've basically been working on for a while, showing that rural gardens can be really, they seem to be disproportionately important because they're yeah. in a a desert of wheat fields and yes, you know yes. occasional mass flowering crop like all seed rape yes. but they're you know they they can seem they subsidize the countryside yes. um and actually they do seem to be rather important if there's gardens around yes. you seem to get more honeybee more bumblebee colonies yes. and things like that yeah. yes. so we're just yes. starting to unpick that oh, effect. Right. so yes. so it's not just towns and cities there's there's mm-hmm. gardens um in in rural areas and in villages and the allotments on the edges yes. of villages mm-hmm. allotments are really good allotments is when we were looking at towns and cities we expected gardens to be good yeah. You know, it's no brainer. No, gardens aren't going to be good for, but the allotments have always been kind of considered, you know, a bit of a farmed area. It's not, yes. it's not a garden, no. but they are fantastic for pollinators. Interesting, they, interesting. they, the, when things like um, carrots and onions go to seed, yes. their flowers are just really good for pollinators. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. And there's always a little patch of weeds here and there, and yes. people grow flowers on allotment. You've got fruit trees, you've got yeah. sheds for the bumblebees to nest underneath because yes. they often like nesting under sheds. And there's just so much about an allotment that is really good for pollinators. And they're also really good for people because yes. there's evidence showing your cortisol levels social, go down. Social interaction. Social interaction and they unstress you. And they're also good for the planet because you're not flying your peas in from, you know, there's no air miles on your peas no, if yes. you grow them on your allotment. Yes, yes, you just yes. take them over on your bike. So yeah. um, so a lot, yeah, more allotments will be good. They're a yes. tiny proportion of cities. Um, but you know, we yeah, and some of them are closing. So I think looking after your allotments, yeah. ideally having more would would be multiple wins, yeah. actually. Mm-hmm. So that'd be a few few of the things. Yes. So phonology is key, having a diversity of things yes. is key. Um and shrubs actually is the other thing. Shrubs actually give you far more nectar and pollen per unit area. Per and they place, last yeah. for a you know, yeah. plant them, they last for 10, 20 years. Mm-hmm. So if you get your um early spring ones in, get your flowering currents mm-hmm. in. And then in the autumn, when things are starting to kind of come, you know, wind down a bit, you get your, your caryopsis and your robelias and things. And you can put a shrub in for pretty much every month of the yes, year. Yes. And, you know, you buy them once and they just and they don't get too big. It's not like putting a tree in your garden. Yeah, yeah. So uh, lots and lots of shrubs. Yes. And e- easily knocked back to you know, regeneration. Yeah. And, yeah. No, they're easy to grow with. Yes, and, they're, yeah. and there's some truly gorgeous things yes, around. Yeah. So. Yeah, no, I think shrubs are like, woody plants are uh, fighting their corn. They are. I think so, they have a bad it, reputation. They're Victorian was, shrubs. Well, I, I, I think uh, the, 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 until the 1980s, the shrubs were so totally dominated garden centres. So yeah. when, uh, there was a revival of interest in perennials, and it swung so the pendulum swung so much the, the other way. Yeah. And of course, perennials do appeal to the kind of rapidly to the impatient. Well, yeah. well they're quick and easy, but at the same time, do both. Yes, yes, kind of, yes. um, but I think also shrubs used to be kind of ever green boring things that didn't reflower much where there's, uh, there's a whole some cases yes. yeah. Yeah, yeah 
Um, or slight laurel flowers fantastically, but only for about two weeks a year. Yeah. So it's not actually, a, it produces a huge bounty when yeah. it does, but it yeah. really doesn't last that long. Yes. And, and uh, going back to the uh, native plants, it, it, it always it intrigues me how different geographical regions have such very different floras. Like in, in Europe as a whole, we have relatively few late flowering species. Yeah. North America, we have this incredibly rich flora, a grassland flora, um, so, uh, you know, our, which is of course one reason why it, you know, over the last 200 years we've so fallen in love with that flora, so mm. the stasis and the Rebecca's and all the rest of it. Uh, with the, that must be quite a boon, I would have thought, for for, for pollinators. Yeah, no. Filling a gap. It may do. It yeah. certainly might. Um, what do we know about that? We know that in the, so I've had students go out and measure flowers in the countryside in um the, the autumn and there's yeah. very little out there. what you've got in the countryside is, is hedera so ivy yes it, yeah. ivy is fantastic so yes. you get ivy in your garden yes. because ivy comes in those it's polymorphic you've got the two you've got the flat creepy crawly stuff yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah and then the, the, the noise is. the noise from pollinators yeah. it can be incredible i mean around, it's right? just yeah, fantastic yeah. for yes. me pollinators yes. um so but in the countryside that's about the there's that and a few, you know, you always get a dandelion in pretty much every month of the year, but there's not many of them in late no, in the autumn. No. So, the odd yarrow. Uh, yeah, yarrow's not, yeah, you don't see much visiting yarrow though, by no, and large. It's not that, I um, don't know why. Um, so, yeah, so the, so having that longer season, I mean, those those queen bees yes. um, get a chance to get, uh, to lay down larger flat yeah, bodies, yeah. which is what gets them through the winter when they're um, hibernating underground. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so I think there probably are some, I mean, some advantages. The city is also slightly warmer. You yes, get an urban yes. heat island effect. Yeah. So if you're an insect, that allows you to forage um, yeah. longer. Um, but um, but I've never seen any really, really good data on what happens at the end of the season. The fact yeah. that um, there was, for a while, we thought that some of the bumblebees were continuing. Um, the Bombus terrestris was considered to possibly just keeping going through the winter. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure we ever really got to the bottom of that no, one. Yeah. Um, you can never quite tell whether it was a really late last fall or really early it's, it's yes, tricky yeah, to tell yeah, so yeah. um but towns and cities would be the place that would happen mm. um and with climate change you just never quite know yeah yeah, um, yeah. great uh so well thank you very much jane that was uh, very informative um uh, i'm sure our audience will all find that extremely <laughs> useful and interesting <laughs> Yeah, no, yeah. The, I mean, the nice thing is to say, pollinators, you're yeah. just never, ever going to get bored. Yeah. Yeah. And, and they come with plants, you know, yes. it's, it's a wonderful combination. Mm. So, yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. So the, yeah, Devil's Bit Scabies is a good one. Yarrow, you say, wasn't so, um, no, wasn't so good. The, the number of um, pollinators on the Devil's Bit Scabies compared to the Yarrow, you'll yeah. get the odd fly on there. Yes. Um, but it's really, yeah, it's pretty quiet on the pollinator yeah. front. Yeah. Mm. Um, the um, knapweed is really, really good. Plant, yes, actually. that's gone over now. Yeah, um, yeah. But it will be fantastically good yes. for goldfinches throughout the, yes, the winter. Yes. So, um, but this uh, it's, the scabies is interesting because it's not round here, but there is a specialist pollinator, a little um, mining bee. Yeah. That, um, you, that only feeds on scabious pretty much. Right. So oh, really? It's one yes. Of these plants which does have a, a really yes. quite a specialist yes. pollinator. Yes. They're, they're, they're not. That's not common. Yes. And is that a solitary wild carrot there? Uh, yes. It's yes. our only one. Yes. <laughs> so, um, so yes. Don't they they die out quickly, don't they? they in uh, yeah. It doesn't yes. like the competition. And no, I, no. I put a few in, and it's the, the, and actually the ones I put in didn't come to anything, mm. and this one actually has yeah, popped up yeah. on its own. No, they, so. they don't really cope with grass competition. No. Very well. no. It, they come up in the what's left of the fire bed over there, but. So, <clears throat> thank you for that, Jane. We ended up in her uh, garden, as you imagined you, we, we, we would. Um, so, now, um, I think we've got, is Jane with us? Um, I am. Yeah, yes, yes. Um, Lois, um, question, I hadn't heard of No Mo May until I was in England this spring. It was... <laughs> <laughs> intriguing how the concept gained momentum as a positive community-based activity. Later in the summer, I was at a Hort event near Seattle and attendees had some pushback against No Mo May. Um, Lewis, could you perhaps explain to us, because uh, I, I, had, I had in fact heard of this controversy, but not really followed it. I, I don't actually remember what the pushback was, but I remember no. thinking, well, how could you be against something like that? Um, and I possibly, would have to look possibly, back. possibly something to do with with the fact that um, a sort of natives versus non natives issue, possibly. It could have been, and it could have been something about unkempt looking yards. Yeah. I don't, we're yeah, so yeah, into yards here. Yeah. I don't, I don't remember yeah. what it was. I just remember thinking, yeah. "What?" Yeah, yeah, 
Um, we've got Rebecca here, Rebecca McMacken. Um, mm. Are you able to throw any light on? I think, haven't you been involved, in fact, in the No Mo May controversy? Yes, absolutely. I'm a big fan, I should say, of No Mo May, um, but I understand the critiques, um, especially here where we have such a different uh, plant palette and, and the way that pollinators are behaving in May in North America. It's, it's not as effective as in the UK. Mm. But the controversy stems from a lot of entomologists specifically um, claiming that when we simply do not take care of land, that it is allowing plants that are not beneficial for pollinators to spread, such as dandelions. And that, and it sort of, it promotes a sort of lazy person's um, strategy for supporting pollinators, as opposed to uh, the real work, according to them, of taking care of land and supporting native plants. And, you know, I understand that. I have a lot of friends who are um, in that wing. I couldn't disagree more. I think that allowing, encouraging people to take action to support wildlife and to come into contact with the animals on their land is, it's actually pretty radical. And it's so hopeful. And we just need to make sure that that's not the last action that people take, that it's the beginning of a broader conversation. My mom uh, did Nomo May last year and she had a juga blooming in her yard, which is an invasive plant around here. And she had a swallowtail butterfly visit the ajuga. And I was able from that, from that conversation to say, okay, here is some zizia. This is the host plant for that butterfly. And now you're supporting the full life cycle of that butterfly. And so I think it's, I don't, I, you know, there's a lot of a lot of our actions are sort of theater, right? Um, and it's really about grabbing on to those good, good uh, impulses that people have and, and supporting them through their next evolution. Mm. Oh, thank you. Yes, it, um, <laughs> it does enlighten us a bit. Um, I mean, uh, Jade. I mean, how how uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, well, it, I, how useful yeah. is no no made? Do you think? Uh, I'm not sure I've actually seen it quantified yet. It's still probably yeah. too too new to do that. But I mean, it, it is interesting hearing about things like um, dandelion and aduga being cast as the villains, which, you know, when they're not a native plant, they, you know, it's um, it depends what you're you're aiming for. In, in Britain, dandelion is extraordinarily good for, for pollinators. And there seem to be some slight unusual things in the um, um, pollen as well. So you're early solitary bees. If you want to find a solitary bee early in the season, the place you go look is, you know, it's find a dandelion and there'll be a solitary bee on it probably. Um and in towns and cities um, where most of the plants in the garden are are going to be alien in origin, then um, it, we kind of worry a bit less about aliens, I guess, in that context. But certainly in, outside of cities, in, in, in Britain, it's, it's different context in the States to here, it really is. So you, you can't generalise across um, in quite the same way. So I'm certainly against having anything that's not native in, um, in, a, in a nature reserve in any sort of um, rural location. But in gardens, it's kind of deemed OK, because something like 85 percent of the nectar that is available to pollinators in, um, in British gardens is going to be uh, alien in origin. It's going to be from China and the United States and, and pretty much everywhere in between, to be honest. So um, and one of the, the nice things about pollinators is they're not actually that as long as they've got nectar and pollen, they're, they're nowhere near as picky as, say, and butterflies and moths, which for the larvae, the adults are fine um, with alien flowers, but the, the larvae are very, very good taxonomists. And they they generally prefer, they some of them are absolutely um, straight, jacketed, straight jacketed into relationships with particular plants or particular genera or particular families. And they, they're nearly always native ones. So it's, it's horses for courses, depending on your context as a gardener and also what you're trying to attract, because for pollinators, it's OK having lots of aliens. Um, but if you want anything else, it's it's not. If you want kind of lots of, of herbivorous insects, if you want the butterflies and the moths breeding, then you need the um, the natives. So um, it it is very context dependent. Mm. But no may may in general, I think is in Britain it can work really well. And people I know that really aren't that interested in um, kind of biodiversity once they try it, it sucks them in really quickly, and they are absolute. They're real converts. Once mm. they see what will happen to their you know a bit of boring flat green space at the back if they just leave a strip down the middle and it's not about leaving all of it then they do get really really interested and they're absolutely amazed by what does come up so um 
So as a, um, as a scheme in Britain, it's really good. And our, our university, Bristol University now does it. And they got a really good set of posters all over the place saying, you know, I'm, I'm not been ignored. I'm part of No Mo May. And, and, you know, so it's advertised as a, and it does get people interested. Yeah, but so much happens in May, doesn't it? Um, yeah. Well, if um, in Germany, Ulla writing, and she thought, thinks that it might stop soil warming up in the spring. So perhaps, perhaps in Germany, continental climates may be leaving it a bit later. Uh, also, Ulla was wondering about uh, saying that many small bees are just mechanically pushed away from the flowers by honeybees. Um, do you think that happens? Uh, we're working on that actually. So we, oh, yeah. uh, there's a big, um, we've got a big project running that ran in Scotland last year, where we're actually asking about. We've got a, it's a large field experiment. We're asking whether honeybees compete with native pollinators because when you if you look at the literature, there's quite a lot of papers on this, but the answers are really variable. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. And it's it's context dependent, basically, we think. So so what we've actually done, so you might imagine that at certain times of the year, there's going to be a shortage of um, pollen and nectar. So if you imagine in Scotland, where we've been doing this work, in August, there's acres of of, um, of of heather, basically. You're not going to be short of pollen and nectar in August in, in Scotland. But in the period before that, um, there can be quite a pinch point. So we're trying to identify those pinch points. And that's why I think the literature is variable, because it depends when you look for that competition. And so if we know when the pinch points are, um, we can actually advise beekeepers who are quite keen not to be seen as, you know, uh, kind of enemies of, of native pollinators um, and actually just get them to put hives out at different times in different places. So um, my gut feeling is that we haven't analysed the data properly yet, but I think there will be times when there is competition, but also other times when there isn't. Um, and there's two types of competition. There's competition for resources, as in there's not enough nectar and pollen to feed both honeybees as managed domestic insects basically by the million because there's huge numbers in hives um but there's also the kind of jostling around for space on a flower which can also happen so honeybees can be quite a lot bigger than a lot of solitary bees so so what we did in scotland so it's quite difficult getting a, f a handle on what's happening without doing a big experiment so i have a phd student with extremely good people skills um, and she persuaded beekeepers to put um not just a couple of hives but large numbers of hives at 10 sites and then we have another 10 sites as controls. And so we can actually, and then we monitor all of the pollinators and the plants they're feeding on at, at the site before and after and during when the honeybees are there. So if you give me another kind of um, six months to a year, I'll actually be able to tell you what, what exactly what happens in um, Inverness and Perthshire and that, that kind of quite a large swathe of uh, central Scotland. Mm, mm. Yeah, right. we, we look forward to it and as indeed we to more of this um, research, I mean, it's just really fantastic to have you know evidence-based yeah. work coming through. You know, hugely informative. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you very much for for joining us, Jane. And indeed, we look forward to speaking, Rebecca. We've got you on next week, haven't we? Yes, I'm so looking forward to it. I can't wait. Yeah, yeah, great. No, we're really looking forward to that discussion. Great. Okay. Well, um, thank you for joining us this evening, everybody, and uh, keep in touch. <laughs>